Welcome back. Let's set up smoothing groups and UVs for our low poly. First things first for smoothing groups, let's select our low poly. Press Shift, right click to radial menu, soften hardened edges, and then toggle soft edge display. Soft edges will be displayed as a dotted line, and hard edges will be displayed as a solid line. Typically we want our 90 degree angles and acute angles to be hard and our flat angles right here, which I guess would be an angle of zero, and any obtuse angle to be a soft edge. And in our modeling package, which is Maya right now, uh, soft edges are gonna have kind of a gradient here. You'll see if we look at it at an extreme angle, it'll be a gradient from black to gray. And that's to kind of show you that it's a soft edge and it might be beveled sort of. But if we go to a hard edge, it's gonna be just its own solid color and the shading will just show you that it's you know a hard edge there's not going to be any bevel here and you know if we wanted to define that by topology we would just go to edge mode and bevel give it something don't do this i'm just showing you as an example go out of edge mode and then see how it would have its own little nice gradient that's just because we're defining this gradient by topology and all these edges we just made are soft. So I'm gonna control Z, some of that back and go back to our piece, deselect, go back to object mode. So to show you how to set that up, I'm going to go back into edge mode, select all my edges. I suggest you do this too. Shift, right click, soften harden edge, and then go to soften edge. And now you'll have something gross like this. So all the edges are soft and you'll notice that the entire thing has this gradient from black to gray. And as you rotate around, it's trying to figure out what kind of shape this is and give you a gradient to define that in 3D space. And we're gonna help this out by defining what is a hard and soft edge. So anything that's a 90 degree angle or an acute angle, we're going to harden. So let's select the edges that represent that. So these edges here are 90 degree angle. If you look at it all the way around, that's a 90 degree angle. These are acute angles, so we'll select these here. These are obtuse angles, so we'll leave these as smooth. Come down to the bottom and select the appropriate edges here. So we've got all those selected, the acute edges here, and the 90s up here. So with those selected, we're gonna do shift, right click, soften harden edge, harden edge. And we have our shading back. We go around that looks pretty okay for Maya and the reason we do that is because when we go to bake our low poly the shading in our low poly is going to be compared against the shading in the high poly and our normal map is going to be kind of the translation between it so that our low poly is going to look like this with shading so beyond 90 degree angles and into acute angles we're not going to have enough information in our bake in our, in our normal map bake to really show this kind of shape. So we help it by giving hard edges where appropriate. Hard and soft edges uh, also mean that we have to kind of do some different stuff when we're UVing and we have to follow some rules and I'll show you what those rules mean. To get to our UVs, let's go up top, go to UV right here, UV editor, and you should have a window kind of like this. I'm gonna scale it down. Your UVs might not look like this. They might look kind of crazy. So to get on the same page as you, let's just, actually you should do this as well. Go to object mode, select your object here, go to UV camera based. And that's gonna wipe everything that exists within this space and give you a camera based kind of view of this shape in UV format. So what are UVs? UVs are how a face or any 3D object is going to look at a texture and display that texture on itself. So for example, I've set up this material. I'll just click the texture. Where's texture? Grab it out a little bit. Click this, should be a smiley face, yep. And then in here, I'm gonna select this little checkerboard right here to show you. And in UV shell mode, you can right click on your UVs or really anywhere in the UV editor, shell mode. You can click this, move it around. So you'll see the UVs are trying to look at a texture that's in this area and display that texture on the 3D model. So as I move this around, 
you can see that it's trying to display this picture wherever these uh, faces are looking. To give you a better idea, I'm going to go to edge mode, select all the edges, shift, right click, cut. And it's going to split all the faces into their own UV shells. And just really quick, I'll go to UV shells, shift, right click, layout. You don't have to do this, I'm just showing you. Layout UVs. So now you'll see I can grab any shell here and move it around. Let's figure out where that goes. It's right here. And now it's trying to show me what texture it's looking at. However, you'll notice that what it's looking at is distorted. Like you'll see, it's just showing this curve here, but it's really kind of making this curve lopsided here. That's because our shells aren't unfolded. They're not actually representing what it is in 3D space. So to do that, we'll select our shells, left click, to get this marquee, grab them all, make sure you're in shell mode. So also before that, right click, UV shell, make sure you're in shell mode. Then left click, drag on a marquee, shift, right click, hold down, unfold, and then unfold. And they should create these actual shapes that represent what it is in 3D here. If that's not happening, if say this one's like super squished and weird and the other ones aren't, that's because you need to freeze transform. So I'm gonna delete my history here, grab object, and make sure your transforms are deleted. So if there's scales and stuff that are wrong, just see this translate here we actually want. So I'll snap that to zero real quick and then just go to modify freeze transforms and click that. Because if that wasn't happening, I'm gonna control C because mine was actually all right. If you still had a bunch of crazy transforms, it's going to unfold based on those. So I'll just re-unfold these UV shell unfold to bring that one back to a square. So when baking, ideally we want our hard edges to be cut and our soft edges to be um, merged. I'm going to turn off the smelly face just for ease so you can see what's going on. And really quick, I'm just going to grab all these edges and sew them back together just to show you what we've got going on. So we're going to select all of our hard edges, which remember are these solid lines. Move this out of the way for a moment. So we've got all of our hard edges selected. And in UV editor, gonna make sure I'm in edge mode. So right click edge, then shift, right click radio menu, cut. Then go to shell mode, UV shell, grab all the shells, shift, right click unfold. And we should have something like this. I think I missed an edge. Yep, right there. So when you have your UV editor open, you'll notice these white lines represent UV cuts, which will help you, you know, navigate around to see what you should and should not cut and what's already cut. So edge, click right there, cut, and then unfold again. This probably won't move though, because it's already unfolded correctly. Yeah. So now we want to make sure that our UVs are oriented in the same way our 3D object is. And this isn't going to really affect baking. This is just so that when you go to look at your UVs, it's easier to navigate. So we'll go to edge mode, hover over this edge, click it. And then in our 3D viewport, tap F, you'll notice these edges at the top here represent the edges at the bottom. So we want to flip this around. So we'll go to UV shell, grab this kind of orient it down. You don't have to be super perfect. I'm going to show you how to make it super perfect in like one button. Move these up. So then I'll marquee select here with left click, hold down. Don't forget to save. Shift, hold down, right click, go down to orient shells, and this will snap them at 90 degrees of angle. So that should be snapped. And now you'll notice these guys kind of turned around. It doesn't really matter which orientation these are because they're on the top and the bottom, but just to make them, uh, you know, the same, we'll take this one and rotate it up. So to snap with rotating, you can, just like in the 3D viewport, click your shell, hit E, and then hold down J and left click, and you can snap them around. So I'll snap that up, and now they're both facing the same direction. And a really easy way to make sure that we get these filled into all the space that we can use is to go to UV shell mode, Grab them, shift, right click, layout, 
and oops, go to layout right there and then hover over this little box next to layout UV and release the mouse button. And then you should have this window pop up. I'm going to reset mine to default. I'm going to edit, reset settings. Then at the bottom, I'm going to change my texture map size to 2048, my shell padding to 10. And do we have rotate, translate shells, rotate shells? We don't want that on. Shell rotation, preserve 3D. Okay, that should work. Going to hit apply right here. And you'll notice that they're now occupying the maximum amount of space that they can so that you get the most pixel depth out of each shell. And our shell padding of 10 pixels, you'll notice, is in between each shell. So this is 10 pixels, 10 pixels, and 10 pixels. The reason we do this is so that when we have mip mapping happening in engine, um, so mip mapping is the further an object is away from the camera, the engine will actually downscale our texture map size so that it's more efficient when it's rendering the scene. So with something super far away, you know, we have a 2048 texture, but it might actually scale it down to 20 or 128 or even 64. So we give it this little bit of space so that our texture holds up uh, sensibly beyond uh, what we're trying to render. I know that sounds like a super bad explanation. Just imagine uh, a green car up close, you have all those small details, like all the rust and scratches and stuff, but super far away, it's just going to look like a big blob of green. But in between, you're still going to kind of want some detail in between, so that's why we have this little bit of gap here, so that the 3D space, these UVs, are going to kind of hold up our texture space. So these UVs here, split along a hard edge and sewn on soft edges, are actually just fine for what we're going to be doing. So I'm going to go back into object mode, snap this back to zero, delete my history, and export what we have here. Oops, just to show you, I'll go to File, Export Selection, make sure it has, or make sure your low poly is selected, and I'm going to name mine Stonewater underscore low, just to overwrite the one we made just before. So you're ready to bake. However, I'm going to show you uh, some common errors that might happen if you don't have your UVs correct or if you have your shading incorrect. In a new scene, I've brought in three examples of our low poly, and this one's the correct one, the one we just exported, and these two are incorrect. And to show you how they're incorrect, I'll bring over my UV editor. This has the correct shading, the same shading, the same shading that we just exported, except there are hard edges here that are sewn together. And on those sewn edges, there's actually going to be some errors that I'll point out in just a moment. And over here, we have the correct UVs. However, everything is soft. There's no hard edges at all. And that's going to cause some shading errors in our final bakes as well. This is Marmoset Toolbag 3. It's a 3D viewer and baker. And just to show you really quick, this is the correct one that we just made after it's baked. Here is the one that has the sewn edges. And if these are all baked for the same high poly, if you notice on the sewn edges, we get this little black edge here. And even at the top and bottom. This is because when we baked with our hard edges, the baker is trying to create this nice soft gradient that goes over both ways. So there's a hard edge here. When it bakes, it wants to make a soft gradient this way and a soft gradient this way. Because we haven't had it split, there's not that 10 pixels uh, in between the two shells. It's having to kind of read into this gradient for this side and having to read this gradient for this side. And it creates a bend in. So that's a bake error. We need to cut these edges and give them some space to breathe. Here's our all soft one with the correct UVs. You'll notice this crazy banding. That's kind of the result that's going to happen. Here, let me focus here. It's got it all over because it's trying to compensate for that low poly shading and the high poly bake. So we don't want that. We don't want these pinching in. We want this. Looks pretty much like our high poly, except it's super low poly. And I'll show you how to get these bakes and how to texture in Substance Banner.
And the last thing before we get to baking, after we have made our UVs, we need to make a cage. And a cage is a 3D volume that's going to dictate where rays are cast. And the rays are going to look for our low poly and our high poly. And whatever high poly information they detect, they're going to project into the UVs of our low poly. So just to help me work, I'm going to hide the high poly first. Maybe I, if I can select it here, just click it, tap H, and it'll hide it. Then I'm going to take our low poly to control D to duplicate. Then by default, uh, you should automatically select your new duplicated one. I'm gonna go back to stone water underscore low, our original low poly. I'm going to tap H to hide that. And then I will click our, what's gonna be our cage. So let's rename this cage. So stone water, just double click there, underscore cage, renamed. And then I'm going to go to move mode, W, vertex going to grab all of our vertices, double click the move tool, which should be this one right over here on the left. Our options box should pop up. Mine was off to the side and see this where it says axis orientation. I'm going to click this drop down right here and go to normal. And you should see your gizmo change from the normal uh, or the regular move gizmo to the normal move gizmo. We want to find the edge that has in on it and we want to gently pull it out so that it expands just a bit. And ultimately, we want to make sure that this shape encompasses our high poly. So I'm going to go back to object mode, turn our high back on, tap H, and you'll notice that you don't see anything. That's because our high poly, actually, within tool, let's make sure we go back to object. When with W pressed, now you'll be able to go back and move this. You'll notice that the high poly is turned on, but our cage is larger than the high poly, so it fully encompasses our high poly and our low poly. Uh, so if you're ever trying to move something after you do that normal uh, movement like this, like say we have our normal turned on right here and we want to try to move this object and you just can't because it's still in normal mode, just make sure you go back to axis orientation, object or world. I like to work in object mostly. So now we can, you know, move it around. So even in object mode, that's changed. Okay, so this is our cage. It has the exact same UVs as our low poly, which is great, just what we want. And now let's export our cage. So with stone water underscore cage selected, our gizmo should still be at the same spot. We're gonna export our selection by going to file, export selection. We're gonna call this stone water underscore cage. All right, so this is super important, by the way, make sure that stone water underscore cage is all the same case as stone water underscore high and stone water underscore low. Because when we go to bake, Substance Painter is going to look for these exact characters, the prefix characters, and it's gonna match them up to our suffix characters of cage, high, and low. Go ahead and open up Substance Painter. You should see a screen similar to this. Go to File, New. And Unreal Engine 4 Algorithmic is the template we want. If it's not there, just navigate down, scroll through it, find it. Next to File all the way over here, we want to click Select. Grab our Low Poly, which is Stonewater underscore Low. Open that. Default settings should be OK. Document at 2048. DirectX, Compute Tangent Space per Fragment. Click OK. And now you'll see it's loaded in our Low Poly. In 3D Space over here, same controls as Maya. And in 2D space over here, hold down Alt and use middle mouse button to drag around. You can also use middle mouse button to scroll in and out. And I think it's just left click or Alt left click. Yep, Alt left click rotates. So these are our UVs, if you remember, spread out in 2D space. We can paint directly on them if we want, but first we need to bake. So your baking tab is over here on the right hand side. You might have something similar to this with layers and texture settings. If you don't see this texture settings tab, just go up to Window, Toolbars, or wait, my bad, Windows, Views, Texture Settings, or Texture Set Settings right here. So with this here, yours might be kind of pulled up like this at halfway. You can just grab this, pull it down just so we can see. Right here, we need this button called Bake Mesh Maps. Click that, and our baking tab should open. Our output size at 2048 is just what we want. 
let's look down here. We want to have a high definition mesh. So we'll go over here, click this little page and we'll import our high stone water underscore high. And then we want to use a cage. That's what we just made. We'll click that and then cage file. You'll see it's blank. We will click the page right here and we'll find our cage, bring that in. The frontal and rear distances will be defined by the cage as it is because we just built that cage to look inside of it to look for the high and low poly. Relative bounding box, ignore back face for this that's fine. Match, we want to match by mesh name, not by always. Anti-aliasing, let's make it look nice. So we'll do subsampling four by four. For now you can do eight by eight if you want. It'll just take a little bit longer to get that uh, bake done. Our suffixes are correct. We made our suffix high, suffix low. If you named yours like Bob and I don't know, Guinevere, you would change these to that, but we used high and low. World space normal, that's fine. IDs, remember how we made our high poly red? We want to change our color source from vertex color to material color. Color generator, that's fine. Ambient occlusion, default should be fine. We're not trying to be super accurate with our AO. Let's do self-occlusion always. Yep. Curvature. You can get really deep into the weeds with curvature settings, but curvature settings here should be fine. Position, yes. We don't really need a thickness map, so we'll declick or we'll uncheck thickness. Thickness is best used when working with organics and you're trying to cast light through it. So if you could imagine an elephant's thigh, if you're gonna cast a bright light on an elephant's thigh, you wouldn't see the light through it. But if you were to cast it on its ears or a leaf you'll see light come through it. So that's what thickness would help us with in materials. But because this is just a rock, we'll tick that off. We don't need it. And then we'll click bake Lambert three mesh maps. Mine will be Lambert three, yours might be Lambert one or any other material. Just click bake mesh maps right here. And I'll be back with you when my bakes are done. You'll notice that our bakes are now populated within the mesh maps right down here. We've got our normal world space ID. The ID should be the same color as whatever you made your high poly. So this is correct, it's all red ambient occlusion, curvature, and position. And you'll see the thickness map is blank. I'm gonna move our 2D space out of the way right here. I'm just gonna hold right here and pull it to the side. And in 3D space, I wanna show you that up here, we can have a drop down menu with lighting is material. Uh, material is whatever we paint on here, how it would look in Unreal Engine 4 or whatever viewer we're gonna do single channel we haven't added anything to these so these should be blank however our mesh maps are what we just baked so in mesh maps if i go to the normal map you see this is what was baked and you'll notice this compensation that i talked about earlier these gradients these gradients here see how harsh they are in the bake but when we tap m on the keyboard to go back to our material it's nice and smooth so if we didn't split those uvs i'll go back to normal it would be reading this gradient coming over here and it'll see a little bit of this completely different purple and this purple would read over and see a little bit of this completely different blue and it'd create that black pinch inwards which is what we don't want but because we split our uvs none of that's happening everything's good so from normal we'll then go to world space normal world space normal is a bake that says where it is in world space so up down left right in 3d space what the faces are Curvature it says what the high poly curvature is. That'll drive some textures or some smart materials. Position, or my mistake, position was the up, down, left, right in world space. So that's what this is. So you'll see up is more green, down is purplish blue. And then we've got the left and right gradient from this brighter green to this teal or green. And thickness should be non-existent. We just get a checkerboard. So tap M on your keyboard to go back to material and then go to layers. Pretty much texture settings is done. So we'll just go to this tab right here for layers. And this is where most of our work is going to be done. Your layers, just like in Photoshop, will live here. And then the settings for whatever tool you're using or whatever mask you're on will be down here. And that's where a lot of stuff is going to exist. So if I create a new fill by clicking this button right here, it's a fill just like in Photoshop, same kind of idea. It'll create fill layer one. Every fill is going to have a color channel, a height channel, roughness, metal, and normal. And if we scroll down a little bit, you can see all these settings right here. 
So base color, if you click the color right here, we can select any color we want. We can play with these settings. Height, we're not going to really worry about height right now. But if you want, hmm, we'll do that in a mask in just a little bit. But roughness is how shiny or how rough it is. Uh, black is super shiny as a mirror finish. White is as rough as it can possibly be. Think about it as this is a roughness value, right? So black roughness is a zero amount of roughness. So that's as shiny as it can be. White roughness is a value of one maximum roughness. So rocks are probably in this range here. We'll figure that out. We'll figure that out in a bit. Metallic, same idea. Black is zero. It's not metallic. We wanted it to be metallic. We changed it over here to one. And normal information. This is the normal for whatever this fill is. It has nothing to do with the normal map that we just baked. If we wanted to change the normal map, we would worry about this uh, normal right here. And to show you some materials that are already set up, I'm going to click right here and drag this up. You can scroll down to Smart Materials. By default, you'll probably be in Materials. Click Smart Materials and let it load. It's going to take a moment. I have a lot of my own Smart Materials. I'm going to try to find one that you probably have so you can work with me on this. We'll probably build our own stone or our own rock material from scratch, but just real quick, I'll show you. I'll grab this Copper Worn. I'll drag it to the top of the stack, just like in Photoshop. Copper Worn will overwrite this uh, teal one underneath. Even then, I'll just probably delete this as we don't need it. I'll show you what the smart material is made of. So you'll automatically see that a worn copper material has been applied to our texture. And it's using our normal map, our curvature map, and our AO to drive some of its details. We'll open it by clicking this little folder here. And you'll see there's a dirt layer, a worn surface layer, and a base material. The base material is just like that teal color we just had. It's just a simple fill, and it's got its base values in it. And then on top is another fill with different settings, but it has a mask that was added to it with a mask editor. So if we were to turn this off, that's that dark color that was just there. And then on top of that is a dirt layer turn that off. It's very subtle, but it's there. It's just in the roughness value, it looks like. So if I move the light there. Oh, to move the light, just hold down shift, right click, and drag left and right. So you'll notice there's probably, you might be able to see the roughness here if we turn that on and off. That's just a mask in the roughness value. So if we click that real quick, the mask is right here. The fill is right here. Click on the fill, you'll notice that there's only a base color, which is white and the roughness value, which is 0 0.5. Everything else has been turned off. If I were to turn these on, I could just left click and they'll start filling in. But we don't want those right now. The worn surface, which is the darker color right here, has a mask over it. And I will, just like in Photoshop, Alt, left click on the mask. You know, see this mask dictates where the dark color is. And if you want to edit this mask, we'll go into the mask editor underneath it. Just click that once, wait for it to load. So the mask editor has a ton of parameters. Pretty much, uh, if we scroll down to the bottom, it's going to use these masks that we baked. It's going to use the world space normals, position gradient. We don't have a thickness map, so it's not looking at that. It's using our curvature and our ambient occlusion. Scroll up a little bit. It's also using two textures. So there's image inputs. This is texture one and texture two. Substance Painter has its own texture sets, its own, um, uh, what's the word? Let's set this back there. It's got its own textures and its own procedural materials. So if I click this, it's got all these resources here. Uh, by default, it should be procedural texture. So it's got all these different shapes, all these different masks you can use. Let it load these grunge maps here. If I were to click any of these, you should see it change there. So this is the first texture and same here. You can blend between them. So if we do vent, for, no, 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 not a normal. Let's grab a gradient, something crazy like this. It'll blend between them. And then each one of these have their own settings for contrast, how much you want it to come in if you want to invert it, patterns. And then, so those exist. It, 
and even more blending between them and with our masks at the bottom exist in here. So with our ambient occlusion, our curvature, world space, gradient, etc., we can open these up and play with them. They also have blending modes, just like in Photoshop. And you can make pretty much whatever you want with a mask generator. Close that for just a moment. To go back to our material, remember, just tap M on the keyboard and see how those changes did that. We're going to make our own stone material from scratch. Or if you don't want to make stone, you can make anything else. I'm just going to show you how to manage masks and how to build materials. And you can go crazy making whatever you want. So to go back to our default settings, I'm just going to delete this copper worn by hitting delete on the keyboard. And I think I del or I closed that window. I didn't really need to. So I'll go back to Windows, Views, and it is Properties. Bring back our Properties panel. I will scale this down. I think the line's right there. Yep. And let's start building our own stone material. The first thing we want to do is create a base color for this. So let's delete this layer here because we don't need it. I'll add a fill, which is this button right here. I'll name it Color Base. And I'll start defining the base color of our rock. So I'll click right here underneath base color. It should be gray right now. We're going to make it a brown because our reference is about that brown. The cool thing about this is you can click this here, this bar. It'll get this color selection. You can click this picker, click and hold down. And then you can drag it anywhere on your screen. You can even go off screen if you have a second or third monitor. And it'll pick whatever color it's underneath. So we'll grab probably about there. Just let go. And then I'm going to move this back off screen. And we've got that color. Our height should probably be zero because we want this to be our base. This is the thing we're going to work up from. So if we want anything going up or down, we'll just change that in its own layer. Metallic is black. That means it's not metallic, which is correct. And the normal, we don't really need that, but we'll have this as a base anyways. Roughness, it's a rock. It's going to be pretty rough, so we'll probably crank it about 0.7-ish. Now we're going to add some color variation noise, because if you look at our reference, it's got that base color, but it's also got this noisy orange through it, and probably even a third noise of a brown. But we're going to add the orange right now, so we're going to go back up here and create a new fill layer. Call this one orange. We're going to add, well, first let's make it actually orange. We can also just pick again. Probably about there is okay. So now you'll notice that this is completely occluding the color we just made. If we click this button right here, it'll turn it on and off. So we want to create a mask to uh, mask this out and then bring it back in with a fill layer. So I'm going to right click on this fill layer, or a fill layer in the mask, I'll show you. Click right there, click add a black mask, and now it's gone, and then we'll bring in a fill on this. So this is the fill layer, this is the mask, we want to bring a fill layer on the mask, so right click on the mask now, and then add fill. And then you'll see your properties change right here, click grayscale uniform color, and you'll be able to pick a grunge layer. So in the search bar, I'm going to type grunge um, concrete, maybe. And then we'll pick one of these. Hmm, concrete old might be good, but this is this has some striation in it. This might be okay. And then let's go into mask view by alt clicking on the mask itself. You can see this is what our mask is doing that we just added. Let's go to our properties within it. So if you click around, you'll lose that setting. So if you lose that setting, just go back to your orange layer, click the mask, it'll open up, and then click on uh, grunge concrete. So we just added, and now we have the grunge concrete's properties. So let's make this, oh, also alt click there again, and then click right there, because I want to see what I'm doing to the mask. We'll make this a scale of 0.5 just to bring it up. We're going to turn uh, projection from UV projection into triplanar projection. That way it's not projecting the texture into 2D space. It'll be projecting it into 3D space and we can get a nice blend across the edges of the uh, UVs. 
Probably turn the hardness down some. Where's that hardness showing up? So right here you can see it's making a seam. If it's super hard, it'll make a projection seam. So if you bring the hardness down, it'll kind of blur it across. So scale's looking okay. Is the balance all right? Let's probably add a levels to punch this detail out. So I'll right click on our mask, hit levels, and I'll play with this just a bit. We want to bring that white up and the black down, just kind of get it contrasting. And then I'll tap M to see what it's doing with the color. That's looking pretty good. All right. Next, we're going to add some black cracks because you can see these have cracks through them. These cracks aren't, you know, realistic at all. This is just some prop made. I think they just probably carved into it and then cast this. You can try to replicate these if you want. I'm just going to grab a cracks grunge and we'll use that. So I'm going to add a, another fill there. I'm going to call this one cracks. Probably going to make it dark, so I will grab the color and crank it down, make it brownish. Let's grab a fill, so add black mask, click on the mask, right click, and then add fill. If we go to our grayscale uniform color, click that once, and then we'll go to, let's just search cracks and see what we get. All right, that's not working. Let's go back to maybe stone. No. What about cracked with the ED? Grunge concrete cracked, that might work. So clicking on this mask, you'll see that the cracks are actually black and the surface is white. We want the cracks to show up and not the surface. So that means we need to invert this mask. So to do that, we will right click on our mask right here and invert mask is right here. It'll add a levels and in this levels, it's just inverted right here. We need these cracks to be bigger. So an easy way to do that, we'll go back down to the grunge concrete cracked. We will change this to triplanar and then we'll turn our scale down to maybe a 0.25. And then also turn our hardness down and maybe rotate it some because we see, I don't really like that crack going across the side like that. A little bit of rotation. Go back to the material M and we need to change our roughness values as well. Cause you'll see that it's pretty flat. Also because they're cracks, we want to crank the height down just a bit. Now when the light goes across it, there's some depth to it. So let's go to our color base, make sure that's kind of rough. The orange can have some roughness. See how it's shiny? Forgot to do that. Just a little bit of roughness variation, so it's different from its base. The cracks can be pretty rough because we don't want light to catch so much inside. Lights down, metallic's good. I kind of want those cracks to be bigger. into concrete, maybe 0 0.2 should be fine. Then let's sharpen them up. We'll click the mask again, go to levels. Not so much sharpen, we're just going to push it in. To mask. Bring that back. It's looking pretty all right. To give this uh, some edge wear, so it appears to have a little bit more depth, we're just gonna add another fill. Call this one edge wear. 
go to the color, grab our color picker, make it our base, but then also a little bit lighter than our base. Put a black mask on it, right click, black mask. Then on the mask, right click, go to generator. Click on this generator button that pops up in the settings. And then we're going to do metal edge wear. I know it, it's not metal, it sounds kind of, you know, incorrect, but all we're doing is trying to get some edge wear and that's what this generator is really good at. We can change the grunge. If you scroll down, this should pop up now your properties. Remember, if you click somewhere else, all you have to do is click on the mask, then go to the metal edge generator underneath. Scroll down inside of it. We're going to use a custom grunge, which is right here. Turn that on and then click your custom grunge input, which is right here. And let's do stone. Grunge stone details. Yeah, that'll be better. And then we can play with our settings up here. Maybe go into mask mode, uh, click alt. Alt left click into the mask, just like in Photoshop, and you can see what you're doing with your mask. Then click back down into your edgeware, so you can change the settings. Let's try planner is on. Start playing with this. Grunge scale. Let's definitely make that down so we can see more details. This is going to be a small object. Play with the edge smoothness. Definitely want it to, so if you bring our curvature weight down, it's going to care less about the actual curvature and edges and just give you, you know, a flat fill, kind of like we were doing before. So we want curvature weight up and we should probably push the rest of this down a bit. But we'll get to that when we can see it. Maybe we're about there. Propagate that in some. We turn triplanar on. We did triplanar blending contrast. We bring that all the way down. I think really the only place that shows up is over here. So we'll tap M on the keyboard to bring back the material. It's looking okay, but probably a little bit too strong. And rather than play with all these settings to turn that or to tune that down, just underneath the mask with the metal edge wear, I'll go right here to this value. Click the little drop down. And I'll probably pull it down just a bit, just to make that mask not influence so much. And probably the last thing, we want to really punch out these details here. And that's super easy. We'll just actually use the AO bake we did. Now for PBR, this is a little bit of a lie. You're not really supposed to add colors to define shadows, but for this, it'll be fine. We'll go back, grab another fill layer. We will make it pretty dark and brownish. Then we'll change our roughness value to be pretty rough. Everything else is okay. Again, black mask. And then add a fill. And then for this fill, we're going to search for our AO bake. So just type in AO. It should be somewhere up here and be an occlusion map from mesh Lambert three. It's probably Lambert one or any other color. We'll just click that. And then we want to invert it because if we go here, we see it's white and black. This is our actual bake. So the shadow is the black. So it's really just giving us the start color. So let's invert it, which is right there. And then we can add another levels to really define that probably. Go into our mask and play with this. Bring those values in, press M. And now you've got some nice shading in there. And I would say this is pretty solid. If you want to add more details to it, if you want to add maybe a third coloration, because we've got our base, some orange, maybe some brown noise in there. You would just add another fill probably down here. So you have your color base orange and then grab a fill, name it, you know, browning. Then you just add a mask to it, black mask, click, add a fill. And then you could define whatever you want, just like in the orange. 
All right, and now we can export these textures. But first, let's change the name of our material, because if we export this right now, it'll be Lambert3 underscore and then whatever map name it is. We don't really want that. So I'll double click right here and I'll call this Waterstone. And now we can export. So we'll go to File, Export Textures, and you'll be meted with this or greeted with this export document. We want to define where they're going to be exported. So we'll click right here. Mine is correct. Class Tutorials Textures. I'm going to select that folder. Then instead of PNG, we want Targas. So we'll open that up, scroll down a bit. It should be TGA or Targa right there. 8 bit is fine, it'll default to 8 bit. And then your configuration, by default, it should be Unreal Engine 4 packed, which is just what we want. If that's not there, you can click this bar. Scroll down, should be in the use. Unreal Engine 4 packed, not the SSS. Dilation Infinite is just fine. You'll see that it says Waterstone now instead of Lambert or whatever it would have been up there. And then 2048 is our document size. Let's export. To make sure everything worked, let's click Open Folder. And mine popped up over here. And let's check out our textures. This is the base color. Let Photoshop open. These are the colors, the um, albedo colors that we put in through each fill. And then our normal map. Normal map should look something like this. Uh, our bake for these shapes here, these nice gradients. And then the height information and the normal information we added in Substance Painter are all these extra details that it added to our bakes the occlusion roughness metallic should look something like this looks kind of crazy but that's because the grayscale values of our roughness our height and our metal are actually packed within each channel uh, each color channel here so we've got RGBs the master let's turn all these off we'll go blue here blue is the AO green is the metallic wait my mistake red is the AO blue is the metallic and green is the roughness so it's not metal it's stone so that'll be black our roughness value if we turn that off uh, remember black is shiny white is rough so our inner cracks are the most rough this is kind of rough and our edges because it's you know if you think of a polished stone the more there's some edge wear it'll be a little bit polished so we've kept our edges a little bit um, shiny and AO is just our bake and when we plug these into Unreal, instead of having a full texture, you know, using all of these and it's just grayscale for the same thing over and over again, we've packed all of our grayscales into one texture and it's much more memory efficient that way. However, some of you are perfectionists, as I am, and you'll notice that in our AO, the only AO was in here and not really in the cracks. So this isn't a huge deal but the AO really should have some here in the cracks and that's an easy thing to do. We can just go to our texture settings right here, click this little plus, and we're going to add an ambient occlusion channel. So we'll click that and you'll see it'll populate right down here at the bottom. Let's go back to our layers and let's think about this. So the cracks are going in, it should have black for AO. So the only place we need to really add AO is in our cracks. So we'll click the fill layer right here We'll go down to the material where we've got color, height, rough, metal, normal. We'll turn on AO by clicking once. Then we'll scroll down to the bottom. And ambient occlusion is probably at one for you. But if you want to crank it down, you'll notice that those cracks are getting darker and darker. And to show that, we'll go up here to ambient occlusion. Well, there's no uh, AO value anywhere else. So actually, let's go to our color base as well. Just so you can see this, turn on AO there, and we'll turn that all the way up because it should be a white value. And then go back to the cracks, the fill layer. Now as we turn our AO on for cracks only, it'll define it right there. Let's probably put it about there. And then we'll go back to material. We can just tap M. And then let's re-export this. File, export textures. Targa, Unreal Engine 4 packed, everything's looking okay. Export. And then we'll open the folder. 
should be this one right here. Update. We'll turn off everything other than AO. And you can now see we have AO for the cracks. Also, I don't really like how much this is repeating. Um, if you wanted to change that, you see if it's the same pattern on all the sides. We might either have to change the rotation now because it's triplanar. So we can either bump up the scale and rotate, which would change the size of our cracks, which isn't what we want, or we could make a cracks for each side and just mask it out, which is going to be a fair amount of work. Let's figure that out. Let's make three folders, which a folder is right here. So one, two, three. We'll put the original cracks in folder one. We will control D to duplicate it. Put its copy in folder two. Control D to duplicate that. Put its copy in folder three. Now close the folders. On each folder, we'll put a mask. So on folder three, as it's highlighted, I'll right click, add a black mask. Folder two, right click, add a black mask and folder one, right click, add a black mask. Now within each one of these, actually let's define these first. So for folder one, I'll right click, add paint layer. Folder two, right click, add paint. And three, right click, add paint. Back down in folder one, let me get this out of the way. And just to keep up with this better, I'm gonna rename folder one to cracks side one. Maybe copy this and put it into the folder here, crack side two. Double click, add it here, three. And then crack side one with our paint. I'm gonna click this paint. And then over here on the left, I'm going to go to polygon fill, which is this button here. Is it gonna show you the tooltip? Nope, but that's what it's called. And then you should see your uh, topology show up with white selected. Here's white, here's black with white selected. We're going to click once right here and the top and this little part right here and on the bottom. So now this folder, crack side one, is going to define the cracks for the whole bottom, this side and the top. So this is the default one we made just a bit ago. I'll leave it as it is there. We'll go to the crack side two paint layer and we'll just click this face here and probably this little bit right here and then go up to this paint for crack side three and it's just going to define this face right here left click and then i'm going to go back to my paintbrush here just so i don't you know forget if i want to start painting i'm just going to save some time a little bit later because usually i forget what i've done so crack side three all these exist within here this is our original cracks, and that's fine. Let's go to cracks two. And in the grunge contrast, or uh, grunge concrete fill, if we move this around, where does this define? I think it's this side right here. Yep. So we're just going to offset it some, or rotate, how about that? And then that's in three, so let's go down to twos crunch concrete, which should be this side. Let's rotate it this way, maybe. And then even move it so it's different. Then I'm going to close these. Just so everything looks a little bit cleaner. Click on a different fill to get rid of that um, box in the middle. And now when we look around, the texture isn't repeating all over the place. So that's much nicer. And now let's save. Well, you should have been saving this whole time if you haven't, control S. And then uh, if you haven't saved before, it'll prompt you to name your thing. And then we'll just go to file, export textures, export one last time, open the folder, check, I'm gonna update this and, sorry, go to AO. And now it's pretty clear that everything is different all around. And I'd say we're done with texturing. Cool.